How many things do you know that are wrong? And I don't mean you know that something isn't true. I mean like how many things do you think you currently know and you say to people as like say a factoid that are factually inaccurate. That keeps me up at night. Take this tweet from my friend the physics girl who points out that when you have a piece of dry ice and it has vapor coming off of it, it is not actually carbon dioxide vapor as I always thought. Dry ice is made out of carbon dioxide so I thought that's what's coming off of it. But no, the air around the dry ice gets so cold that it's condensed water vapor making all of those with Biz. How many people have I have I told this to? I've, I've told many people about dry ice and how it works, and I've been wrong for years. What is the cost benefit of just checking yourself for two and a half seconds versus being wrong forever? That's what keeps me up at night. You know what? I'm gonna check something else. Are chimpanzees really like 10 times stronger than the average person? Because I've thought that. I may have said it. Most recent computer simulations suggest such differences could result in muscles that were 1.35 times stronger than ours, just 30% stronger. Them chimpies aren't that strong. I've been wrong forever. Check yourself. Before you get chimped wrecked by a chimp. Dang. They'll chew your face off. It's not their fault, though. They're chimps. Hello and welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections, and I smash them with an evolved primate fist of science. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, ooh, it's gonna be shocking. And not in like a clickbaity way. More than like a Warren Beatty way. That's not true. It's about Thor. I love puns. My video don't want none unless you got puns, hun. But getting right into it, in the last episode of Because Science, we were trying to figure out the crazy physics behind the Men in Black's famous weapon, the Noisy Cricket. I said that the Noisy Cricket would have to fire its projectile if it really throws a fresh prince through the Bel Air. Then it would have to fire projectiles at faster than any projectile has ever been fired ever, and that projectile would be going faster than some galaxies move. Hello! but what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from M.G. Karaman, who says, Kyle, 20% uh, the speed of light is faster than anything on Earth, LHC. What am I, a joke to you? Yes, all right, so what I said does depend on your interpretation of the word fired. I said that the noisy cricket would have to fire a projectile up to like 20% the speed of light, which is faster than anything ever fired on Earth. The Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC, moves protons and other particles around its many kilometer long ring to smash atoms together at point, oh, let me get this right, at point 999999990C. And I did not know this, this is amazing. It moves protons around the LHC just three meters per second slower than light speed. Just like 11 kilometers per hour. It is accelerating protons to a speed so high that just your running speed added on to it, just your human running speed added on to it could take it to light speed. It is crazy. So that is obviously much faster than a noisy cricket projectile, but are they really firing projectiles around the ring? Is a proton really a stand-in for whatever the noisy cricket is firing? I don't think so, but you're right. We have accelerated things to higher final velocities than what the noisy cricket seems to be doing. You are correct. Oh, this wasn't a correction. What are you gonna do? Change the video around and waste maybe a minute? <laughs> nah. I'm speed running this thing. Verbugter Herr de Dunkelheit, nailed it, says, so you could, in theory, make a rocket jump in TF2 style with the noisy cricket? In theory, you could indeed do a rocket jump. The only reason why you can't is that the projectiles or the weapons that we have today are either not firing something heavy enough, fast enough, or light enough fast enough. So in video games, double jumping or rocket jumping is a very common theme. You point your weapon towards the ground and the conservation of momentum as you fire the projectile downwards pushes you upwards. So if you were to jump and then fire, you could get a double jump. But anything that is handheld that we could just carry around and fire doesn't have the kind of momentum change, the kind of recoil that would give you a second jump. In theory, it is possible. And would that just actually snap your arms if you could double jump with something? I'm gonna say probably. But that's for Dunkle Heights to decide. Dinkle Height. Verbeter Hair Day Dunkle Height. Ooh, all easy names this week. Uh, Miguel 
Alejandro Ephraim Aesthier says in the TV series for Men in Black, which I watched and I liked a lot, it had the possibility, the noisy cricket, to put a, su a suppressor on it, which would control the recoil. And many of you pointed this out. So a suppressor is supposed to make a gun or a weapon quieter. And it does that by giving the exhaust gases that come out of the muzzle of whatever this thing is a different place to go, a many chambered metal cylinder like you see uh, suppressors look like. These suppressors apparently do affect recoil, but not for the reason that it's also suppressing the sound of the gun. Suppressors add a little bit of weight to the very end of the gun, which could help with a rotational moment, the force that would act to rotate the hands backwards, and that could affect recoil or your perception of the recoil. What you're actually, I think, referring to is what's called a muzzle brake, and you may have seen these on the ends of some tank cannons. These are designed specifically to take the exhaust gases and not quiet them down and put them into some sort of chamber, but redirect them. So out of a tank, if you had something like a muzzle brake, the projection and some of the exhaust gases would come straight out, but a lot of the exhaust gases would be redirected to the side. And because they're coming out of the sides and not forward in equal and opposite directions, they kind of cancel each other out. And so there's not as much exhaust gas at as high a velocity coming out the center of the cannon's muzzle brake. And so that's not adding to the recoil. You are shunting some of the momentum away from the recoil direction that moves you backwards. So I think you're talking about a muzzle brake. If the Noisy Cricket had a muzzle brake on it, then I think it would affect it, but a suppressor, eh, that's hard to say. It would have to add a lot of mass on the end of it, but the Noisy Cricket isn't that heavy, or it can't be because it's so tiny, so a suppressor would probably suppress it and affect the recoil somewhat, but not eliminate it because it's so huge. I guess you could say no matter the case, there's still a total recoil. <laughs> ah, you got what you want, they'll give these people air. Come on, what are you out of your mind? Black Lightning asks, could Iron Man fire the noisy cricket without hurting himself then? Well, Iron Man is an interesting case because he has so much more infrastructure to help support this massive recoil. You see in Infinity War and Endgame, Tony Stark can use his nano suit specifically to like plant his feet into the ground and have like a metallic support structure, like his own kind of scaffolding. And if you had a suit, with a mechanical muscles and it could plant itself into the ground, it would fare much better with the recoil than your squishy, squishy body would. But would all of that recoil uh, flow through the suit down into the ground such that uh, Iron Man wouldn't move? I give Tony Stark the benefit of the D on that one. Doubt that is. Oh, yes. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to Matthew Spriggs, who suggests using something a lot heavier to get the same amount of recoil that we see instead of a very light projectile like I suggested. Uh, he says specifically, what if you use something like neutron star matter that the men in black would presumably have some kind of access to? And if you do that math, which we can do, uh, you'd have a projectile of the mass, uh, Matthew says, of two billion kilograms, which would lower the velocity, the needed velocity to fire this weapon to get that recoil significantly. I actually did the math on that. And if you fire a neutron star pellet from a noisy cricket, it only has to fire at one millimeter per hour to get the recoil. That's how heavy neutron star matter is. If you fired a neutron star pellet this fast, yeah, I'm doing this in real time. A millimeter per hour. It's going this fast. If you fired it this fast, it would be enough to... Oh! throw you across the room. Neutron star matter is incredibly dense. In fact, the densest stuff that we know of in the universe is basically just the nuclei of atoms smashed together uh, as close as they can get due to gravity without forming a black hole. Could the men in black be using something like this? I don't think so because it's not a slow moving projectile and it would explode if it wasn't under the pressures that a neutron star is normally under. And how would you hold up a two billion kilogram gun? But I like where your head's at and for doing some math of your own, which I always highly encourage. You are indeed Matthew Spriggs, a super nerd. Oh, Spriggy. 
But I'm not always right, of course. By far, the biggest correction this week comes from a number of you who are all saying the same thing. From what I understand, I'm quoting all of you at once, from what I understand about the noisy cricket, it probably wouldn't be firing a solid steel projectile like we were just assuming as an example. It would probably fire some kind of energy or plasma or even a sound wave. How would that change our calculations? Here's the beautiful thing about physics. We know from the movie that Will Smith has some momentum change. Something is acting upon him some force to change his momentum over time. So this means that whatever the noisy cricket is firing, it must have some mass and some velocity. So whether that mass be from some air in the form of a sound wave, a pressure wave coming out from the gun, whether that be some plasma, the fourth state of matter, with some mass coming out of the gun with some velocity, and whether that be some kind of ultra dense pellet, it still would need to provide the exact same momentum change that we calculated. So it doesn't really matter what the projectile is, as long as it is within the range of the mass that we are assuming, a few milligrams, which it would be if it was a plasma, for example, or just a little bit of air noisy cricketing out of there, then the momentum change is the same, and so it doesn't really matter. It would matter in terms of what damage it would be doing to something, but because not everyone's eardrums are immediately ruptured and all the glass is breaking and everyone, you know, kind of dies just from the sound wave. And because we don't see like a flash coming out from the gun and traveling across, I think probably something like a simple projectile is the most likely option. But if it were plasma, sure. And we will get to a super nerd who has a lot to say about that. Yasha has a correction who says, great video, but what if the pellet that we are assuming was much denser like osmium or tungsten? Those are much heavier elements. In fact, osmium is the densest known natural substance at standard temperature and pressure. Like I could just hold it here on Earth. It is incredibly dense. However, because the projectile would still have to be so small, the reduction in overall velocity just isn't that high. We're still talking about a velocity that you could easily express in a percentage of the speed of light. So no known material on Earth is dense enough to bring the velocity down enough that the noisy cricket would stop being ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. It's almost like it was, you know, like a sci-fi weapon in a movie. Oh, it's so cold. Frequent commenter Shinjiji has a correction. So I was thinking on this, when the recoil hits, it impacts all of Jay rather than just his hand. In theory, if the recoil acted as you'd imagine, his arm would jerk back and he'd break his own nose or be thrown off balance by that point. You are absolutely right. What you're describing is muzzle rise. And I thought it would just be interesting to go through why, why does a gun, even when you're you know, you're a kid and you're like, bang, bang, cops and robbers or whatever. Did you do that as a kid? We, when we fire a gun, we always do this, right? It always jumps up and that happens in real life. Why though? Well, it's again, physics. If you think about where you hold a gun and where the forces are put on your wrist, they are, you know, lower. They, you're holding on to the bottom of the gun. You have your finger around the trigger, what have you. It's near the bottom of the gun. And if you think about where the mass actually comes out of the uh, barrel of the gun, it is above the point at which you are holding it, above the point where those recoil forces would act on you. Because there is some distance between these forces, when it actually fires, it creates what's called a moment, a rotational force on where the force is acting. So because these forces are not in line with the center of mass of this gun and the projectile and where this force is coming, it actually does create a rotational moment that forces the gun upwards, and that is muzzle rise. Don't have a real point after that, so... Her last correction comes from Spider Doom, who says, I love the show. <laughs> Thanks. But I feel like traveling faster than light. You may say that I can't, but people a long time ago thought flying was impossible, and look at today. I'll do it. You'll see. No, you will not. And if you ever actually do, technically, I won't be able to see it. That's some 300 IQ level thinking right there. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to Bob Spitfire, who says, I think the noisy cricket is actually a plasma weapon firing milligrams of plasma at thousands of kilometers per second. And mainly the reason why I'm saying this is because I wanted to bring up a weapon, now classified, known as the Marauder. Now, I didn't know about this, but the Marauder, uh, there was a study published in 1993, and it was immediately classified after that, so we don't know much about it. But the Marauder was a weapon uh, that stood for Magnetically Accelerated Ring to Achieve Ultra High Directed Energy and Radiation. It was a weapon, basically a railgun, that was designed to shoot 
literally a donut of magnetically confined plasma at 10,000 kilometers per second, they thought could be the upwards velocity of this thing. So they were firing just milligrams of ultra hot gas, basically, that was magnetically confined to look like a donut out with a railgun, funk, at extremely high velocity. And they say in the paper that this extremely high velocity and this very tiny, tiny amount of plasma could upon impact equal about five pounds of TNT when it hit something. Now, if the noisy cricket was a plasma weapon firing at these ultra high velocities, the velocity kind of checks out and the mass kind of checks out and five pounds of TNT, would that destroy the side of a truck? I think it'd probably blow up the thin aluminum of a truck. So could the noisy cricket be like the now classified marauder? I think so. And it's, I think it's a fantastic suggestion. But if you look at the momentum change for the marauder, it's around 20 kilogram uh, meters per second. And the noisy cricket had around 200. So even this crazy classified weapon is still only one tenth of the momentum change that the noisy cricket is. So the noisy cricket, still ridiculous, ridiculous enough to be classified. Maybe that's why the men in black have access to it. Maybe it's a classified version of an ultra small mar marauder weapon. I think that actually works. And for coming up with this, Bob Spitfire, you are indeed a super nerd. Ah! Now, for the next episode of Because Science, who this week it is why Thor isn't immune to electricity. That's right, we are finally getting to a topic that you all have been asking me since Thor Ragnarok came out. Why can you tase the God of Thunder? If he is immune to lightning and his own lightning, why can you put a space taser on his neck and tase him with the very same electricity he's supposed to be immune to? I think we come up with actually a pretty good explanation for why you can still tase Thor and it will be canon. I talked to Taika Waititi about it. I did, I just tweeted at him, ask him where he got them rompers. Cause I wanna look like a, I I want to look like a millennial pineapple too. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science. If you haven't yet, all about Men in Black's noisy cricket, leave me all your best nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. <gasps> I'm not doing so hot. And don't forget, it's better always to check yourself before you factually wreck yourself.